so we were uh, we left at a point where we saw the some of the guidelines about uh, the visual design aspects and in fact i was going through some of the uh, submissions that day which was this miss universe uh, card and there were some very interesting uh, inputs there probably i'll upload it on moodle later on but i saw uh, people had thought out of the box for a couple of things and although there was not much of uh, evidence about the use of the entire space a lot of people only did it in one corner of the whole paper but a uh, lot of people had given a thought about the graphics which can be used hierarchy which way can be explained and other things so there were very interesting uh, submissions there let us just go ahead we, after the point where you have the presentation in place this is a uh, end of a new development which has come up over a period of time about when you have a slide presentation and it goes into actual projection mode then there are these effects which uh, into play and uh, actually the range is really uh, wide you have multiple things happening and i have seen some very serious presentations getting ruined by some of them so i thought i will have a small segment about what to do and what not to do about this because people usually ask me questions whether transitions are good they should be there shouldn't be there end of question so let's let's just go ahead with that so there are this uh, two types of effects which are very common and one of them is about within the slide so you can have elements coming up within the slide like i was showing you this animated text but there are also between the slides so what we call is transitions so there are umpteen number of transition and with every new software coming up there is something else starting you have this barn doors and you have uh, some blast you have uh, this is very popular one the page curl you have uh, venetian blinds have this 3d things box turn and all that flying this is a this is another very crazy way of uh, putting up text this there is really a huge range of things which happens here and it shocks you so much that you finally forget that what was this whole presentation about when it started because uh, what was the topic because all these things really keep on hammering on uh, something which is not relevant for that topic so let's just unwind and uh, come back to what we were actually doing so the typical guidelines for the impress part is your objective what is your objective while doing this presentation apart from the content you want people to take back the message whatever you are wanting to say they want them to take away the message but what you don't want is that the audience shouldn't be taken away by the message or taken away from the message so if they just lose the point in what you are saying because of all that jazz then you are ruining your own roots because you don't want to do that at this point this is a very uh, common kind of uh, debate about form over function so if i i would like to simplify that in context of what we are doing here um there's a larger debate about form over function in every aspect of production otherwise like what what should be the form for the given function and all about but for us suppose we say how do you show a message and uh, the function is what is the so message is actually the function we want to show and form is how will it be shown so if if this is the standpoint we we start off with because we are into communication skills class so if we want to show a particular message it should be wrapped up in in the form uh, sorry the uh, the way in which it is to be used by the audience so for example the message is to show a bunch of bristles to either clean or apply is is the brief then there are multiple possibilities right what could be those uh, can you imagine i would just say show some bunch of bristles to clean or apply so you will immediately ask what to clean what to uh, where to apply and it depends on uh, various applications so it's not the same answer it can differ based on what's the application 
for, of that. So for example, I give you uh, three options for teeth or for paper or uh, for a face. So you can easily see that the same type of bristles won't be applicable for either of them. So it will not serve the purpose. So what you see is for teeth you use a toothbrush with bristles and uh, for face you use a shaving brush probably or a makeup brush and for paper you have the painting brushes. You can't swap these based on, uh, the form can't be changed if you have the, uh, you cannot mix the functions with that. If you know that the application is for teeth, you possibly can't use the paint brush for that because it will not serve that purpose. So it depends on what message you are trying to say and to whom you are trying to say. So depend on, depending on that, you can transform the entire packaging so that it, it serves this purpose. So my take on this is that form and function, you can't, you can't say that one of them is completely unnecessary. So both are important. We need form as well as function, but we need to balance the attention given to either of them. So if we give inadequate attention, then uh, you can see that it will be ineffective. Because you have absolutely brilliant content, no problems in that, but presented in a very lousy manner, it loses its appeal. On the other side, excellent presentation, zero content, again loses its appeal. So inadequate attention will have this problem. Excess attention, what we just saw, like have too much of jazz, will create a chaos. People will not get the point what you are trying to say. So this balance is important and that is why you have to uh, be very sure about uh, how you can get that. And the presentations I am going to be uploading on Moodle, the uh, kind of rule I am following is that the one slide which has the green dot will be the guideline slide most of the time. So you can just browse through the entire PDF with those, wherever you have these green, green dot slides, those can be used as guideline slides. So the suggestion is go through all the guideline slides in order to get the best balance between form and function, especially for the kind of presentation skills we were talking about. The another motivation for this segment or this, uh, this part of the course was to see how you can change your application of uh, visual communication uh, skills, what you have learned in the presentations, what you will be submitting. So be sure of uh, these guidelines when you are creating your own presentations now. So those five minute presentations will be crucial. Final presentations as a part of this course that I am planning are essentially your seminar literature survey presentation including for those who are not registered for a seminar, but who will be given a topic to do the literature survey. So I would expect that to be a regular 15 minute presentations with slides. Because that is what will serve a useful purpose for you when you eventually defend your seminars or projects in future. So the five minute presentation that we did at the beginning was more like an icebreaker for you yourselves to watch oneself and others. But those 15 minute presentations will be like almost formal, good technical presentations made publicly to the group of students, but it will be a technical presentation. That is what we plan. Right, right. And so, therefore, we would expect the preparation of all your slides, etc., etc., keeping in mind all the fundamental principles of visual communication that Dr. Sastrabhadi has loved. That's the whole purpose. So when you start making those presentations, right now they could be on these topics, what we had distributed and they are uh, duplication of that at times. But now start thinking in that direction, what would be your final day presentation, which is, uh, which will be a 15 minute presentation. So keeping this as maybe an assignment for just brushing up your skills probably and I would, uh, I would actually try to comment on uh, some of these things so that you get some feedback about or maybe we'll try some peer feedback also. But uh, the idea is that over a period of time, you, you go through uh, these sessions and then the final presentation has some glimpses of what you learned here. As a bottom line, when we decide of any medium as such, and this is a very common question asked to me, uh, like I'm not sure whether I shared it or not earlier, 
I come from a fine arts and animation background. I am an animation filmmaker. And when I went, uh, when I came to IIT Bombay as an animator, and I started working in the area of how animation can be used for educational purposes rather than the entertainment purpose. That was my research point when I came inside. So one of the common questions asked by most of the faculty members to me that, okay, can you convert this to animation? It looks very exciting. So uh, the answer is that not every topic needs animation as a medium. It's not a thumb rule that everything can be animated I, or everything rather should be animated is not a true thing. The medium should be chosen based on the content. So if you are not able to explain something using the initial stages of communication, like you, you cannot explain by uh, talking, then you write. If you cannot explain by writing, then you draw. If you cannot explain by drawing, then you can photograph it. If you are unable to do that, then you create a multi, like moving images, like you create a video of that. And some things which are beyond that, like we had an example from chemical engineering where the lab uh, had a heater inside around 1000 degrees Celsius where camera can't go inside and we have to show some combustion inside. That is the time when we shot up to a particular point where things are mixed up inside. We take a cross section and then show animation of that, that what happens inside. So that is the only point where animation as a medium is legitimate and is, is the best use of the medium happens at that point. It's not a ironed out decision that okay everything will be animated and uh, because I see lot of e-learning content nowadays and these companies which are overselling their product by saying okay here is entire animated book of standard 8, give it to your kid and the kids will enjoy like anything. But that's, that's actually very anti because you are killing the imagination power and recall power of the students by showing them uh, some images which you think are appropriate. So uh, that is another reason why people who are uh, diehard novel readers hate the films when they are made using those novels because they have a mental model of, of uh, Harry Potter and his den and uh, the villain's den and all that. And then when they see in picture that okay this is not matching their mental model of what they had imagined then they start disliking it, right? So it's it's very, just by black and white uh, papers which are printed there, you get so much of freedom to imagine the way you want to imagine it. But the moment it is on celluloid and cast in stone, you, you are not able to agree with it. And that's the biggest challenge of a director to convince all the people who come to the cinema theater to say that this is the exact visualization of what we thought. So like when people see Mughal Azam, they say yes, if, there was a Shish Mahal probably in that time, it could have, couldn't have been better than this. This is exactly how it was. So that, that's how visualization plays an important role, how you can convince people about this. So content for the given audience should govern the decision of choosing the medium. Uh, and the mediums could be uh, informative visual, it could be the appropriate design. And by design I make mean all the <coughs> elements of design, like it can be text, color, um, balance, contrast, everything. And then the strategy. So how do you actually bring in front of people? So whether it is a poster or whatever the medium could be, the strategy could be anything of presenting it. But the content should be the starting point of all of that. And if that is uh, firm, then you will end up creating a very good uh, presentation model or module. So that is, that is very, uh, crucial point which I feel you should uh, take back. So I think I will, uh, this was the part which was, uh, I couldn't do that day because uh, uh, we had we had a different discussion coming up suddenly last class. So now that uh, this is the takeaway slide. So let the content and this application decide the use of mediums, whatever the thing, whatever font, color, whatever you have. And uh, like I said, use these green dot slides. And the last point is very important. What you saw last class, um, the goof up which happened even in my presentation, the testing before presenting. You should just remember Mr. Murphy every time. Everything which can go wrong will definitely go wrong. So my heading itself wasn't visible in the class that day. This takeaways right now what you can see wasn't visible that day because the projector was kept on a high contrast mode. So high contrast will only show black and white, it won't show grey. So my text was in grey, it will not show that. So such things will definitely happen and if my heading is not seen in the presentation, then what am I presenting about? 
and especially when I am presenting about presentation skills itself, that is such a uh, uh, sorry situation. So testing is very important um, and definitely I take the onus of that. I should have come early, tested it with the projector on and then see that everything is looking in the correct format. Now with advanced technology and the projectors really having good quality things, you, you are saved with lot of other problems. But at times there is to be a range of colors we used to suggest. Like you have web safe colors, we used to give a range of projector safe colors. Because some type of red is not advisable to be used on projector. It will bleed. The text will not be readable and such things. Yellow will not be ever readable. It won't be readable at all unless until you use it on a black background. Um, at this point, I am also reminded of uh, one interesting article I read yesterday about uh, presentation skills of Steve Jobs. So that's a uh, interesting uh, article going around. And if you see his slides, uh, you will find that very little content on each slide. Obviously, there was an argument that uh, Steve Jobs is presenting or marketing a product. So uh, I have a problem where my seminar has a topic about and, uh, wireless networking where I have five bullets in one thing. So uh, I can't compare that with what Steve Jobs is doing. But if you mark particular things in that, use of fonts, use of color, and especially because when the Apple conference happens, it's a dim lit room, huge room, but a dim lit room. So he deliberately uses black backgrounds for uh, his slides and the font will be as big as possible and he will just use maybe one or two words on the slides and a nice picture. So also there is an interesting use of gradient on his slides. So if you see his slides will be dark on the top and lighter on the side. So it just gives you a visual flow that okay you have to come from top to bottom. So that kind of a visual flow he implies in the design itself so that you whenever you see his presentation you can find out exactly what the presenter wants you to see is communicated directly in that fashion. So there is no ambiguity about it. So test your presentation before doing it. So this is a tip for the last 15 minute presentation what you'll do. Because once you start presentation, then you can't probably go back and say stop the recording, I'll do it again. So remember these things, probably they will be useful. So thank you very much. I have uh, my email ID is here in case you want to and you are on Moodle anyway. So you can anytime contact me or anything else. Thank you very much. Let us give you a big hand for this particular. Thank you. So in the remaining time, I propose to share some thoughts on public speaking, which is a natural extension of whatever we have discussed so far. So what do you associate public speaking with? What kind of event? So what I am doing, is it public speaking? It is, in a way. The presentation that you will make to a group of teachers and students for your seminars would be a public speech. A political leader addressing one lakh people is definitely public speaking. Any specialized lecture delivered by an expert to an audience is also public speaking. Let's consider such a lecture in the context of technical speakers. There could be two types of audience that a speaker might face. One, a set of people who actually understand in depth the subject matter that is going to be discussed. This is typically the case when you are doing a seminar presentation or a annual progress presentation, etc. Because the group of people are well versed with what you are going to talk about. The other is technically minded people, but not necessarily experts in the field in which the speaker has expertise. So consider Dr. Kakodkar giving a talk on, uh, let's say, the uh, Pokhran 2 experiments. He actually gave a talk at IIT. Now, that talk was attended to by some 350 people, not necessarily nuclear science experts, not necessarily nuclear technology knowledgeable. They were technical people, they were all faculty members and students of IIT. Do you agree that the pitch that one makes and the content of the talk 
have to be completely different in these two occasions. Although the material that is to be conveyed has to be same. Now these are some aspects of organizing your presentations for a public speaking. But let us start with the basics. First and foremost, you all heard this word oratory. Many of you would have, would have become good orators. How do we, while learning in our normal schools and colleges, get a chance to become good orators? Can you cite instances where the skills in oratory could be learned and mastered while we are students, which is what all of you have been? Uh, you participate in different competitions. Okay. All of you have participated in some kind of debate competitions. All of you, anybody who hasn't, everybody has. Okay. Now let me ask you another question. You have studied in schools and colleges. Did every student of your class, in every class, participate in some debate competition or the other? No. Does it mean that such people who don't participate in any kind of debating event or speaking event would necessarily be denied the opportunity to learn public speaking at all? No. So where would they learn and how would they learn? So when you campaign, just standing for social secretary of the hostel, for example. Okay. Yeah, actually, I was the social secretary in hostel one, but I don't remember campaigning. Uh, but anyway, that is one occasion when you will talk. So basically, talking to people is what public speaking is all about. It's not always about giving lectures or something like that. Just speaking in a group discussion, for example. A group discussion on a general topic, when it comes to you to speak, when it is your chance, what you are doing is public speaking. Oratory is an extreme competence gain in such public speaking when you have to address large number of people on varied topics. Fortunately, we are not immediately concerned with that, although that's a good skill to have. It so happens that when you understand the basics of public speaking, you invariably move upward into the direction of becoming a good orator. It is natural sequence. So, why I have written this word is, actually that should be the intrinsic ambition in each one of us. To end up becoming a good orator, it's not necessary that we must become a political leader for that purpose or whatever, whatever, but we should all become good orators. And while there are natural skills and natural inclinations of different people, like all skills, it is always possible to learn the basics and acquire adequate competence. So always distinguish between an absolute master in a skill and a minimum level of competency and skill. They are two different things. Absolute mastery will depend upon several other things, including uh, natural inclinations, including aptitude. Music, for example, all, all of us can learn the basics of music. But if I want to become a Mukesh or Muhammad Rafi, that will not be possible. I, I mean, I know it. But does it mean that we cannot learn to sing basically? We can, provided we take so much effort right from the child. Let's come back to the two basic principles of public speaking that are very vital and fundamental. One is called the stage fear. What do you understand by stage fear? Facing the large group of people, so uh, you forget what you have to say. Okay, this is one one. Uh, no, no, no. You are now trying to explain why we forget. Okay, well, what she says is that. Stage fear in her mind is equivalent of seeing so many people and forgetting what we want to speak. And she is trying to explain why that happens is because she believes that when you see so many people, you may feel they know a lot more and therefore what to say. But the last sentence that you said 
is actually just one of the parameters that might occur to you. I might independently develop stage fear without even thinking that people know anything about what I have to say or not. In fact, even if I'm addressing people who are complete morons in that topic, okay, I may still independently develop stage fear. So stage fear is not fear of the stage, but the fear of standing on the stage, facing a lot of audience and knowing, realizing that everybody is watching you. So that discomfitures people. How do you get rid of stage fear? Everybody has stage fear. Everybody. Except the kids. If you have seen any program in a kindergarten school where three or four year old are asked to come on the stage and speak, I mean, they might be shy kids, whatever, whatever. But they do not have stage fear. Why? No, they do not have fear. Period. Fear is a intrinsic natural syndrome which is there in children, but it escalates as we grow up. So we start fearing everything. We start fearing failing in an exam. We start fearing facing an interview. We start fearing facing a mob. So fear gets accentuated. In the children, it is least. And whatever elements are there, that is the time when you should eliminate those elements and make people fearful. So in general, stage fear is about fear facing people. There is no single nuska for solving this problem, but you have to keep articulating yourself. Then you will find that the actual mob in front of you is not desperate to eat you up. They have their own things to do. They are actually humoring you by being present when you are speaking something. They are actually doing you a great favor. And the fact that they are not starting to shout at you or give you galis immediately or something, they patiently sit and listen, should be taken as an indication of a great bonheim with the people. So you are among such people. You should never have, therefore, have any fear. You should speak. Really. There's also a fear of making mistakes while speaking. So that is one more parameter, as you said. This is another parameter. All these parameters of fear actually occur to us in a complex combination whenever we are speaking in this. And the only answer is practice. There is no shortcut to it. It is not uncommon amongst groups. That is why you have mock defense, for example. Have you heard of mock defense or a mock seminar presentation? It's like a dress rehearsal. You have a drama stage play, people have a dress rehearsal. Why? They want to see that everything in a coordinated fashion works well. So a mock defense is like you collect four or five of your friends and make a presentation. In short, what will you be doing towards the end of this course will be actually a mock stage presentation. And apart from ensuring that your technical presentation is up to date and correct, one of the aspects will be to ensure that you completely eliminate stage fear by. So one suggestion is when you actual 15 minutes of recording is done for your presentation, you do a mock presentation yourself before that. That is practice. There is no, no shortcut to the practice. The second important aspect is flow of speech. When we do not have adequate practice, while we speak, we, we might be very clear in our mind on the points that we have to speak on. But, and we might have organized our thoughts, etc., by jotting down on a piece of paper like this or whichever way. But the flow of speech will get interrupted again if we do not have adequate practice. It is a human weakness that while we speak, we might believe we have coherent thoughts, but while speaking, suddenly, We'll get cowed on one sentence. The next sentence will not come naturally. We might make mistakes. Please remember that when you are doing a public speech, much before people become aware of your mistakes, you become aware of your mistake immediately, the moment you make a mistake in a sentence. And that awareness causes consternation. 
and can lead to more problems and more mistakes. Okay. So it is best if you make a mistake in a sentence, just stop and say, I mean, or something, and correct it instantly. Or simply forget it and move forward. But faltering while speaking <coughs> is a thing which naturally happens to all of us. And again, practice is the only way. There is no shortcut. And the less you are accustomed to speaking continuously, the more practice you need. There is no shortcut. So practice for the flow of speech. Let me now come to another aspect of public speaking where Organizing points of your public talk. How do you organize the, the main points? Do you put them one, two, three, four, five, six? How, how would you like to do that? Remember, the objective is not that you present your points well. The objective is that people remember those points well. The purpose of public speaking is not the great enjoyment and acceleration you get in saying, Are ghanta par baat ke It's not the objective. The objective is, all the people who attended the Ghantavar Kushto be acha kam ka suna. So, for them to say that, it is exactly the difference between good teaching and good learning. Good teaching makes you very comfortable and happy. But does it necessarily translate into good learning? Well, learning depends upon the, as I always say, it depends upon the effective time spent by every individual mind on that subject. And, in fact, the best teaching is one which can just motivate people to spend that much time, either individually or collectively. So, while effect, good teaching may result in good learning, it is not implied that it will. Similarly, good public speaking may result in self-satisfaction, but may not result in the impact that the public speaking is required to have. And what is the impact that you are required to have? You want people to remember what you have said. Human memory is short, but if you are making important points, you would like them to remember for a long time. If you are making extremely important points, you would like them to remember it for life. How do you ensure that? For short time, for a slightly longer time, how do you ensure that people remember the main points that you speak? Uh, repeating a point is one thing. Maybe by telling some stories or some kind of... Uh you know, uh, showing some visual yes, effects. that's a good so point. That... Telling stories or showing some visual about a point. Mm. But emphasizing that point. Otherwise, people will only remember the story and not the essence of the story. People remember morals of stories, so... Okay, morals of story. Yes, that's the part of practice. But I'm talking about how you organize point. By recording yourself and listening to that, all that you make sure is that you are able to maintain the proper flow of whatever you are going to speak. But yet, what you are going to speak depends upon how you organize you. So, we are talking about how do you organize you. Have, has anybody heard Mr. Azim Premji speak? He uses a very interesting mechanism which I have tried to borrow in some cases. So, typically, in any short speech, he will say, today I am going to tell you four things. And then he will mention those four points. Number one, this, two, this, three, this, four, this. Then he will elaborate those four points during his talk. And in conclusion, he will say, so today, my dear friends, we have discussed these four things. One, two, three, four. So, Dr. Anand Deshpande was once telling me that when he heard Azim Premji, he had simultaneously heard another great speech by someone. Six months later, as far as the other person is concerned, he says, I could only remember he had given a great speech, but I could not remember what he talked about. Whereas Azim Premji's points were still ringing in his mind. So this is one aspect of subtly emphasizing the main points that you want to convey. You say one, two, three, four, five, whatever. It is often useful to provide a summary if you are giving a general talk. This is what I have learned from Prakash Vaidya, that you, pay, you prepare a two-page summary and paste it because 
not all but some people would like to go through the material that you have given in your public speech and a summary is useful this is the reason why when you submit a seminar report or an mtech project might be a thick report but you are always required to write an abstract and conclusion because the abstract and conclusion is a giveaway immediately the main point at uh, so that is no so what i have said is the flow of speech it covers not only uninterrupted continuous fluent speech but it also means the flow should be pertinent to the points that you are offering so this and this go hand in hand actually because a logical means if one point should be related to other logically like this concludes to this yeah, point uh, uh, yeah, you are right but in my opinion logic is a bit complex thing what is logical to me may appear completely illogical to someone else so logic is not uh, what should i say uniform or universal it often is subject is like uh, uh, word reasonable i think i shared with you the objection that a student has raised when in one of my question papers i had said in case of difficulty make reasonable assumptions and state those is just if he asked me to define what is reasonable which i i did not and i had to finally tell him what is the general principle even for public speaking i speak based on what i think is reasonable you will interpret me based on what you think is reasonable now this harmony establishment is one of the objectives and if you can relate to a large majority of people there is always a additional problem in any public speaking every human being is a unique person and therefore every human being is also unique in the perception in the background in the context and in the mindset it is impossible therefore to guarantee that any public speak will make exactly identical impact on every listener it is not possible what you want to do is maximize the impact and that is the advantage of some of these things like making points and so on a few simple tips about what is called the body language what is meant by body language anybody there what do you understand by body language of a speaker movement of hands eye contact facial expressions okay so what he is saying is he thinks body language is it comprises of movement of hands or gestures in general facial expressions maintenance of eye contact anything else the internal fear of the person brings stiffness in the body which is evident to the audience okay. so this is an important part which uh, we missed in the earlier discussion the unnatural stiffness in the body that might come i would only like to add that so this human fear as you said is one thing the general stage fear is also a component of that the other possibility is merely my own imagination about my own adequacy of preparedness i may be well prepared but when i go i may feel oh am i am i really ready for it so take uh, some of you may be teachers already if you might have felt it i feel it like that the first lecture of any course any i have been a teacher for 45 years but when i have to face my students for the first time in a course in a semester the feeling is different the body does tend to become stiff but by practice it doesn't actually or at least it is not visible although it becomes stiff. why first lecture because that is the ice breaker once you establish a rapport with people then subsequent lectures are perfectly unfortunately in general public speaking this luxury is not available you will not see the same audience again ever and therefore you have to get rid of uh, this problem so stiffness in the body is one associated with that is one more aspect that that, that we already talked about like facial expressions is important part eye contact is an important 
stiffness of the body again has to do with body line how does the body look to begin with so the dress you wear does it make a difference nobody mentioned that so if you are if you are giving a speech to let's say uh, chairman and managing director of 50 banks they are all sitting there you know how the bank chairman dress they are all in their suits or something like that and like a typical iitian i go wearing my slippers the shirt not tucked in and then i say okay today we shall discuss something something what kind of impact are we going to make so being well dressed or being properly dressed for the occasion is also an important aspect of body language in the public speech never ever take shortcuts you might have noticed that when i am traveling uh, when i am moving around not engage i actually use crocs shoes but when i am taking a lecture i wear proper shoes It's just a matter of habit so you have to be properly dressed it's not that people are looking at my shoes but if they ever look at my feet and if i am in chappals something will be discordant in their mind eh garbar there is nothing to do with the material that i am speaking on absolutely nothing to do. so these are called the tangential impacts they are all important so in conclusion about the body language which we said proper dress properly dressed meticulously dressed avoid stiffness in the body because of any reason be relaxed and natural but don't slouch relax does not mean like this you, you should be relaxed but uh, well stated maintain eye contact in public speaking do not look at only one segment of the group so if i keep doing public speaking keep looking at him okay first of all he will be overtly embarrassed and the others will soon soon start ignoring whatever i am saying this is not good so you should you should sometimes you should address this segment that segment that segment and always maintain eye contact so these are all common sense principles but often forgotten may i request you to do one thing just write them down 1 2 3 4 5 6 points that these are the main point you are smart enough to remember them afterwards write them once this is not a submission not not now not today but write them somewhere so that at least you you recite them in your mind last point i wanted to make if you are using board like this or if you are using slides he has already covered the various aspects i just wanted to add one point never clutter the board okay this i learned from a, an extremely good teacher of mine you look at what i have written here i have written this 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 and this there is nothing else in the board you saw i don't know whether you noticed but samir sastrabuddha when yesterday he was explaining thing he has written the set of slides etc etc but inadvertently at some point he wanted to write an additional point and he wrote it somewhere like this you should what you should do is you should remove that material old material from the board and write only one line because people who are seeing it from a distance their mind they will see the clutter they should not you are very clear in your mind because you know what you are doing exactly the same thing about slides never ever make busy slides he gave a good example of slides which are only one or two words technical material is often very difficult to convey using just one or two sentences but in all my general talks now as a principle i do not have more than one single sentence or one single phrase in a slide nothing and some pictures it really means very effective public speech if you want to develop some material like developing a proof of a theorem or something where you have to have multiple thing first break that matter into multiple slides absolutely must if you have more than five or six lines in a slide people are not going to read it or they are just going to read it and not listen so remember that always no cluttering if you are using a whiteboard non busy slides very effective slides you can use a paragraph animation or something you can bring one one sentence after another if you have to put five lines on a single slide but doesn't matter if you have five slides each one with one line 
provided you can link up those slides in your talk. We'll, we'll talk more about it in the subsequent classes. In the next two sessions, I will be describing in more details uh, the uh, literature survey part and the assignments which we have to do. Incidentally, I have lost the names of people who do not have a seminar topic. You remember that day you gave actually a sheet. Uh, so please remember to, I, I remember approximately about 10, 8 or 10 people were there. I'll prepare those 10 topics. But I would like you to send me a small email with the subject CS uh, 792 as the subject line and just say uh, no topic for seminar, just something like that. So that I will create a topic allocation. All right.